This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I read this week in one of the commentaries I was looking at, um, Paul Actemeyer, who is a New Testament scholar, suggested that we might retranslate one word from the way that we normally do it. When Satan, is, or G, the devil, is talking to Jesus, he says, if you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. If you are the son of God. Now, when I first heard that, that to me sounded kind of like fighting words, didn't it? You know, if you are the son of God, prove it to me. And I could just see Jesus you know, putting his dukes up, kind of like that. But Actemeyer suggests that it might be more appropriate to translate it as, since you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. And when I thought about that, it really changed the whole perspective. It's no longer about Jesus having to prove himself to this upstart devil. It's asking Jesus to kind of start taking some of the inheritance of being the Son of God and showing how he's going to live large when it's his turn. Since you're the son of God, you don't need to go hungry like this. Take this stone and turn it to bread. Since you're the son of God, I'm willing to give you all of these if only you'll kneel down and worship me. Since you're the son of God, throw yourself off the temple and God won't let you hit the ground. Do you see the difference? And there is a subtle type of temptation that's involved. Now, if you'd like, I can go back and give you kind of the list of all the things that should be tempting you and you've got to deal with and everything else. But I really want to just focus on one today unless I have a lot of requests for the other. <laughs> Nobody wants the salacious or boring temptations. You just want this one? Great. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, actually. Uh, <laughs> You know, when you set one of these, things, these rhetorical questions up and everybody says, no, no, we want that. It doesn't work so well. But if you go back, what was the first temptation? Not in this gospel, but what was the first temptation? Anybody? Feel free. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that one? We were all there, right? Okay. Even in Palm Springs, you can't really say that. Okay, um, Adam and Eve have been created and they've been put in this wonderland, this, this garden of delight. That's what Garden of Eden means. And they have it to themselves. And everything is theirs. And the serpent, it doesn't say the serpent is the devil or Satan or anything like that, but I think you can read between the lines. The, the serpent comes up and says, Oh, can you eat anything you want out of the garden? And they said, oh yes, we can eat anything we want. Well, except for that one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if we eat of it on that day, we shall die. And then the serpent says, you won't die. He's just kidding. When you eat of that, you will know the difference, and you will become like God. So can you, you can see the wheels turning immediately, even though he's in the middle of this garden where absolutely everything belongs to them. There is no competition. There is nothing to get in their way. They have this relationship with God and everything else. And as soon as somebody says, oh, you won't die, but you'll be like God, you can see them wanting to immediately have it, right? What was that first temptation? The first thing that the serpent did was he sowed distrust between Adam and Eve and God. They were in total relationship with God. And the one thing that the serpent gets in is mistrust. Jesus, I believe, 
And I have to tell you here, I'm following some of this from a fellow named David Lose, who's a professor at Luther, Luther Seminary. Jesus is dealing with exactly the same battle. And especially when you change the translation from if you are the son of God, and we get rid of the fighting words, and it's since you're the son of God, all of a sudden it's about Jesus not proving to the devil who he is, it's about Jesus proving to himself. It's about the devil getting between Jesus and God and sowing that little bit of mistrust. Well, you know, you think you have to do it this way. But I know you've got the power. You can do it this way. You don't have to be hungry. You can be filled because you've got it. You don't have to run around with no place to lay your head. You can have palaces because you're the one. If only he'd let you act out like you want to. You can do anything you want for good PR to get the people to follow you, and I know you've got it in it in you, if you just don't listen to that calling you receive from God. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism barely a chapter ago. The Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness to be tested, and when this testing is all done, the Holy Spirit will drive him on to his ministry. Jesus is completely wrapped, filled, connected with the Holy Spirit, and the only test that Satan really has is to get him to start rethinking whether he really wants to do the mission that God has put him on. The devil's big challenge is to exploit the potential that there's a seed of mistrust between Jesus and God. Now, I believe that that is critical for all of us because Jesus, um, Jesus made it through all these things. And I, I want to take a second to think about this. We're only reading about three tests, but it says that he was tested for 40 days while he was fasting. And after he was done fasting, he was really hungry. And then the devil comes up with three more and then the last line says, when the devil was done with all of his testing, he left for not. So 40 days in advance, we get the top three here, and Satan could have kept after him for another couple days. We don't know. But Jesus stayed firm. It said that the devil went away until an opportune time. And I want you to know that what that really means to me is that the devil never went away because the devil was always there picking at him, trying harder and harder to put a wedge between Jesus and the God who made him and called him. And that wedge, we will see, get really um, painful in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus is waiting for the cross. And he still has an out. Now, we can think about our temptations and our testing. None of us, to my knowledge, has had anything like what Jesus has had. But I think that there are some things for us to learn about this. I don't think it's all that uncommon for us to really wonder if we, to really wonder if there are things that might be dividing us between God and one another. Now, Probably all of us have a list of things in which we are very well willing to trust God. I'm not thinking of something as silly as, you know, I, I trust God that when I turn on the switch, the light will go on. What if, um, you know, Susan and I have been married for 35 years, and I have trust that God is in that relationship and will be with us and connects us together, and I have absolute trust in God about that. So can you think of things in your own life where you have that sense of trust in God? I'm looking for head shakes, you know. If somebody gets up and runs out, I'll say, oh, wait, they're waiting for the second half of the question. Okay. Um, but then there's things 
where we might have more trouble with trusting God. You know, I think um, when it comes to children, I have more of a problem trusting God because I'm just wondering, you know, is that so-and-so ever really going to get it? Do you think, God, I, I, I just not sure how you're working with this. And all of a sudden I realize that I don't have the same level of trust about a child as I have about God. And what I'm wondering is, is that the place where the devil is trying to sow a little seed, a wedge of mistrust between me and God? Now, do any of you have places where you're not 100% sure how trusting you are? Nobody has. Okay. I see at least there's two. Two people have mistrust. Okay. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not alone. Sometimes the mistrust is really more at the root of who we are and what we, how we are valuable to God. I had the real wonderful experience to listen to somebody yesterday at a 12-step meeting, and the person had a wonderful witness, but there was one thing that he shared that I'm not sharing his story, I'm just sharing something that was a very commonplace thing that I hear, is that he talked about how much of his life He really didn't think he was worth anything to anybody. He actually believed he was not worth anything to anybody. And if he had gotten the wrong idea about it, his parents set him straight. You're not worth anything to us or anybody else. And so he had a problem with God too, right? And he just wasn't sure that he was worth anything to God. Well, what I want to talk about right this minute is that just as Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was with him, surrounding him, propelling him, supporting him, and sustaining him through all of his testing and everything else, a testament to how beloved he was in God's sight, I believe that the same is absolutely true for us. And that when we deal with these issues of where we trust and where we mistrust, first thing we have to do is get to the root and understand how big is God's promise to us. And that's where I turn to the reading from Romans. And it says, the word is very near you, in your hearts and on your lips, that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And it says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can you imagine a more loving God? A God who tells all of us, and this isn't, by the way, this is just Paul. Paul's quoting Old Testament here. This is from the beginning. God loves us so much that God is not saying any of you are worthless. All of you are worth the abundance of the love that God has for us. And God says not just Episcopalians will be saved if they call on the name of the Lord and worship with the proper liturgical flourishes. It says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that is problematic for us Christians. It is a problem for us Christians because not only do we immediately rush off to saying, well, those other people who aren't Christian, how can they call and this and that, we even fight amongst ourselves about the Christians that will call in the wrong way, the Christians that speak in tongues or don't speak in tongues, depending on where you come from. We have all sorts of ways that we try to sow seeds of mistrust amongst one another and in the rest of the world. Somehow, do we have anything to gain for the rest of the world knowing that unless we show up to your rescue, God's not going to love you? All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What I want to invite you to do for this first week in Lent is to reflect about the places where you can be confident of your trust in God. Really dig and identify some of those places where you're not so sure of your trust in God. Identify if part of that lack of trust might be because you carry old tapes that had really nasty messages about how valuable and loved you were, 
And I want to invite you to offer all three of these up to God. And I want you to do it in mind of the great gift and promise and Holy Spirit that God in abundance shares with all of us and says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord is beloved by God, will be healed, made whole, will be filled, will be saved. And make that your meditation as you begin this Lenten journey. Amen.